Well, I have my done my part. Now we're on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm pressing on the upward way, new high Sunday. here. Certainly glad to see all of my church members. If you happen to be visiting here, either with family, maybe just passing through, or just looking at uh, new congregations, we're glad to have you. Uh, we would greatly appreciate, though, if you'd give us a record of your attendance. If you look, I think, on the back of the pew, but also in the bulletin, there's a QR code where you can fill it out that way. And if you don't want to do that, I know you can all read and write. And on the pew in front of you, you'll also find a card, and you could fill that out. And again, we'd greatly appreciate that. Uh, before we continue in our worship, I want to read out of uh, Psalms 135. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, you servants of the Lord. You who minister in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Your
first, I'm thankful for that rail. Can we pray together, please? Dear God, thank you for letting us be here today. Thank you for the people that started this church and the people that are keeping it going. Thank you for the young people. Let us be an example to them and help them as they're growing up. Please be with the people that are traveling that can't be here today and be with those that are sick. In Christ's name, amen. I was going to be doing this morning, so when I got up, I put on my dress blacks. You no, know, Joe sometimes explains away the tie. This is my pretty much as formal as I get these days. So we gather around the cross this morning, and the thought that I wanted to kind of talk to you guys about just a little bit was a word I've used before, but it's separation. And on Wednesday night, I was in a class, and 
Ben, I can't even remember where in Exodus we are or where we were, but we were talking about when I believe it was the 70 elders went up with Moses and Aaron. Remember that, where they were going to get their authority, um, that they were going to be able to, you know, and they found themselves in the presence of God. But we spent a lot of time talking about that because we were like, wait a minute, no one can, what, the face of God and what? But yet they found themselves in the presence of God. But what I noticed in the class was, what did they use to describe that presence? They described a sapphire-like robe, a road below their feet, below God's feet. And why do you think it is the road that they described? Where were their eyes? Their eyes were looking down, right? And throughout mankind, we knew the one thing that man could not be was in God's presence and live, right? Until what? Until Jesus died on that cross. And that's when that separation ended. And then the story that reminds me the most of that is remember when Jesus was on that cross and either right before or right after, I'm sorry, I've got my, my, my storyline a little confused there, but the earth shook and then what happened? The curtain was split in two. And what was that curtain there? Why was that curtain there for the history of the Jewish people? It was there for separation. But when Christ finished on the cross, that separation was ended. And then you guys remember the story in Acts chapter 8? If you know the story by that verse, you know it better than I do, because I was going to tell you it was 7 or 10. I had to look this morning. I was in the area. But who knows the story of the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch? And remember that they were about to leave, but before they left, who came to them? Remember, it's called the Acts of the Apostles, but from the little study we did and the other group, Travis, what are we going to call it? The Acts of what? The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because before Stephen left, the Holy Spirit came to him and said what? He said, you go down there. And who did he find? He found a man of great wealth but a man who has probably spent his entire life, he traveled from a far distance and he came to court. But when he came to court, when he came to the temple to worship God, how far in could he get? Just the outer area. And why? Separation. But Stephen went and explained to him that that separation did not exist anymore. And why did that separation not exist? Because he was reading Isaiah. And he didn't quite know what he was reading, but he had enough humility. And children, I want you to understand this as well. Sometimes when we read the Bible, it's not always going to make a lot of sense the first time through. But we have the humility to go to somebody and say what? Help me understand. And when that man asked him to help him understand, what do you think Stephen explained to him? Stephen explained to him that all the separation that he experienced his entire life, was it needed anymore? All the pain. And for the parents of the children, I want you all to do me a favor. On the way home, ask your parents to explain to you what a eunuch is. <laughs> Come on, that's just going to be fun for me. But when you understand that, you understand that that was another reason that he was going to look upon as an other, as somebody else. But when Stephen explained to him, you're no longer an other, that Christ came because there would never be this group and that group. There would only be what? One group in Christ. And when that man understood that, what did that man do? With all his wealth, with his entire entourage, he looked to Stephen and what did he say? He said, There. He could have been over there. I don't know which way it was. There was water. What prevents me from going there right now? And children, I ask you the same thing. If you haven't endured that, if you haven't gone into that water, I ask you, what prevents you from making that choice? 
Because if you don't want to be separated from God, there's only one way. And that way is through that cross. And I was going to ask you children this morning, if this was a cliff and this was a cliff, what would we need to get from here to here? We would need a bridge. So if God is here and we're here, what is the bridge that we're talking about this morning? Go ahead, tell me. The Holy Spirit. But what is this thing right here? What does this represent? The cross. Exactly. And if we need to get from where we're at to where God is, the only way to get there is... So if you want to know what a bridge looks like this morning, this is a beautiful version of a bridge. Right? And so imagine Paul in that chapter 11 that we read so much, knowing the story of that eunuch who no longer wanted to be separated, knowing the story of the curtain being split when it was finished, knowing that Paul himself threw stones at the people he considered what? Other. Knowing that he was wrong to create that separation. And then he found himself in a room where people who were supposed to understand that there was no more separation, what did they create? They had a room with what? A room with those who had means and a room with those who did not have means. And why do you think Paul got so angry? Because they found another way to create separation. And so this morning as we gather, and you guys can go ahead, I just want to ask you one thing. Paul, in that moment, he told us to examine ourselves. He didn't exactly say what to examine, did he? But I'll tell you what I think he was thinking. Is that for anyone in here who has done anything this week to create separation between where we need to get and to God for anybody else, if by our actions we gave anyone a reason to stay away from the church, by our actions, by our hypocrisy, by our lack of love, by us not being who other people would want to gather with, then maybe that's a good time right now as we look at this sacrifice of the body on that cross. Now, for those of us who are perfect and didn't do any of that, you can just plan out your week. There's a little quiet time here. Surf your phone, I guess. But for the rest of us like me, maybe we should take a little bit of quiet time to reflect on the fact that, A, we're no longer separated from God because Christ built that bridge on that cross. And B, ask ourselves, now that we have found that, that we've crossed that bridge, or that bridge is there for us to cross, have we created a roadblock for anybody else? And the beautiful thing is, if we did create that roadblock, is Christ's blood, did it stop healing on that cross? It didn't stop healing, did it? It's still healing today. And whatever you did this week that you need to think about, that you need to remedy of, you come right now, huh, and it can be healed right here, right now. Take this quiet time to do that healing, to build that bridge, to walk across. Will you all pray with me? <clears throat> Lord, at this time, we just want to take a moment to thank you, to thank you for this bread that we're about to partake of. Thank you for the heart of the lady that made it. And thank you for Jesus' willingness to sit upon that cross. May we remember that he was not the only man that the Romans killed that way, but he was the only man that could have come down at any time. But he chose to stay there so that the great chasm between us and you was healed for eternity. Thank you so very much for this time, for this place. Thank you for giving us this memorial that we can partake of every week so that we can remind ourselves of what a great gift this is. And just like that eunuch, Lord, we ask that when we see that water, we run to the healing waters of baptism. And we run to your healing hand. May we not experience separation anymore, but yet may we gather as one 
and as we gather together in communion with each other, may we commune with you. For it's in your son's Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so now we take a moment to just focus on the next part of this feast. Now that we've partaken of the bread, we look forward to the fruit of the vine. And that fruit of the vine reminds us that throughout mankind, sacrifices were made. Even with the Hebrew people who had a direct relationship with God, they tried to sacrifice many animals as they were commanded to do. But all those sacrifices could not close that gap. And they could not end the separation that God knew had to be there. From the moment we left the garden, the only way for us to get back was through this blood of this lamb. And if you remember what that eunuch was reading in Isaiah, remember what he was reading in Isaiah? They led the lamb to the slaughter. And let's pray for the blood. Lord, thank you so very much for this moment that we have, that we can come to you, that we can remember that the way we show you we love you is by keeping your commandments. But we know that we're going to fall short in keeping your commandments, Lord. Thank you so very much for giving us the hope, giving us the will to do the best we can, but knowing when we fall short, this blood that we see this morning, this blood that we partake of this morning, that it cleanses us. And whatever errors we make, Lord, we know we can keep coming back to this cross and that your love will shine upon us because when you look at us, you see Jesus. And when we look at you, we see Jesus because he is in between us and you and he has made it to where we have the, the most wonderful access to a father, to our Abba Father, that we can have love and he loves us. 
For it's in your son's name that we pray and we ask that we continue to take part and be part of his family. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and we give thanks for this blood, this fruit of the vine. Amen. Now we take a moment to focus on our opportunity that we have to give this morning. And if you're visiting with us, please understand that this is not a time that we need or want anything from you other than that little card in front of you that has your name and and a way for us to just say thank you for being with us. But for those of us who are members of this church, we have an opportunity. And what we really have an opportunity here is to ask ourselves In this world, especially among people who live as blessed as we live, what is one thing that separates us from God the most? Or one thing that we can fall prey to? Go ahead, somebody say it. Sin, but money. And our love of it, right? Can create separation. And so God gave us this opportunity to say that very thing that most people in the world around us are going to hold on to tighter than anything else and going to prioritize above everything else, what does God give us an opportunity to do with that? To take that priority and just knock it down a little bit and by saying the thing that everybody else wants to hold on to the most, you just give a little bit of it back to me just so you can remember that your priority is with me and that my priority is you. Right. So this morning, as we just take a moment, let's just give thanks for the situation that we're in. Let's give thanks for the ability we have to give and maybe give thanks for the peace that we live in that creates the abundance that we get to enjoy.
Lord, as we come to you this morning, we just take a moment to thank you for this place called America, for this place called Texas, and this place called Salado, Bell County, Williamson County, where we get to live, where we get to live a life of abundance that most kings and queens could have not understood throughout the history of man. May we never take that abundance for granted. May we never take for granted the men that came before us and the women that came before us that gave us these opportunities that we have. And Lord, as we live in that abundance, we ask that we take just a little bit that you've blessed us with and that we give it back to you so that we can remind ourselves that the things of this world are not what we hold on to tightest, but the things that we hold on to with the most fervor, with the biggest grip, and with the the, the tightest hold that we can hold. We grab on to the things we haven't even seen yet, the faith that we have of that life to come, that hope we have in heaven. And Lord, may we grab onto that with a confidence that the rest of the world can understand, but the rest of the world wants to. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks. Amen.
This morning I'll be reading Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10, followed by Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind, to reward each man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Where do you think y'all are going? <laughs> it is that time, and they know the path. It's also time for us to stand, please. And sing, Turn My Heart, followed by Lord, Take Control. <laughs> each and every one of you today, and we pray we find a blessing by being together in Christ uh, this morning. I'm quite sure in his day, he was very much in demand as one who addressed things like college commencement ceremonies. The funny irony of it was, he himself never graduated from college. But then in those days, he was just one in a whole line of uber-successful people who were also without degrees, guys like Bill Gates and Michael Dell. I mean, what had he done except 
been the visible and upfront partner and co-founder of a little company, you may have heard of it, called Apple. So when Steve Jobs was asked to address the graduating class of Stanford University in June of 2005, you can bet he had them eating out of the palm of his hand, pun intended. And here's the apple that he was urging them to take a bite of, and unfortunately many of them did. It's a very poisonous thing that he was selling and espousing to those graduates. And you can tell that from some of the last lines of his speech, which I have courtesy of a book, of a book by Shane Pruitt. He quotes the last lines of Job's address, and I'll put them on the screen here. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. Did you hear it? Did you hear the most poisonous part that is a dangerous lie that came right after, came right after the words, and most important, I have it highlighted here, have the courage to follow your heart. How often have we heard sentiments like that even in our day? That, that was quite a few years ago, but we hear that all the time today when we maybe ask someone for counsel or advice about what we should do or how we should act or live or whatever. Even many counselors will tell you these kinds of words, something along the lines of, follow your heart, do what seems right to you. Do it your way. It's a common refrain today. Before I get into this lie any further, let me just say I'm returning today, and from time to time, we'll come back to it. A series that I led you through last summer, uh, which I called Lies and Dumb Sayings We'd Like to Believe. We would like to believe them. Uh, and this word from Steve Jobs is uh, his mouth to many people's ears is just another one of these kinds of sayings that we need to hold up to the light of Scripture. And to see, and it doesn't take us long, it doesn't take us long to hold it up to the light of God's Word, to see how phony and destructive it is for someone to go with this advice, if you want to call it that. First, let's speak to a moment about what's meant by the heart. For biblical writers, and of course Steve Jobs himself, we're not, he's not talking about the, the uh, blood pump that God has given each of us that keeps our system running, keeps our bodies going. The biblical writers used heart to mean the seat of emotions and feelings and desires. So let's go back and ask him again, as if we could. He's been gone for quite a while now, but Let's get this straight, Mr. Jobs. You're saying that you're encouraging folks to be led around by something that's as fickle and changeable as a West Texas wind? Now, some of you may not know how fickle and changeable that is, but believe me, it is, okay? Uh, I've lived there, I can tell you. And often our emotions and feelings are, can seem that way at times to most all of us. Not a very reliable compass or guide, I would say. In fact, the prophet Jeremiah in 17 verse 9 says this about how bad an idea it would be for us to truly follow our heart. You just heard it a moment ago, but you'll hear it here again. Uh, the heart's deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And then the convicting word comes after that, that Jeremiah gives of God's own words. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Jesus also concurred with Jeremiah in his uh, segment in Mark 7 that came out of a teachable moment that the religious authorities gave to Jesus when disputing with him about what it is that really causes uncleanness in a person. They were wrangling with him about all the external means, like washing of hands, that he didn't, he didn't 
wasn't very particular about, nor were his disciples. And when called out about it, Jesus pointed out that it's not about whether a person's hands are clean or even what items they put in their body that makes a person clean or unclean. Rather, it's all about what comes out of the heart. Note what he says there in Mark 7, 20 through 23. It's what comes out of a person. That's what defiles them. For it's from within, out of, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come from sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Here's where I'm heading with this. If we're sold on following our heart, really letting our feelings decide who we're going to be and how we're going to live, then we're falling for the same exact thing that Satan espoused in the garden and convinced Eve to do. And I, I apologize just a, a little bit here. I, I didn't realize in pulling this one out to talk about today, this particular lie, that it would mean reviewing just for a moment the text that we were in just a couple of weeks ago out of Genesis chapter 3 and talking about the fall and, and the temptation uh, that Satan gave to Eve, placed before her. But I'll try and be brief as I can about that. But let's revisit that scene for a moment. What was Satan essentially selling to Eve or, or telling her? prompting her. He was telling her what folks like Steve Jobs have been urging on people ever since. Ever since he first did it. The lie that she could be her own God. That she could decide for herself. That she could just let her emotions and her feelings be her guide and decide to have her own personal autonomy. That was the lie that he put before her. Do what felt right for her. And I'll kind of paraphrase here. Eve, you don't need God. Big G. Be your own God. Believe in yourself. It's your life. Do with it as you want. You just need to follow your heart. That's really what Satan was selling uh, Eve on. And she fell for it. And Adam fallen suit, hook, line, and sinker. And from that moment on, you see, before that, we could follow our hearts. Why? Because they were in tune with God. And we had that face-to-face -face fellowship that we've talked about that was lost in the fall. But after that moment, and ever since that moment, our hearts have been corrupted by sin so that to follow them and going our own way is to lead away from God and a life with him. The Proverbs writer says it more strongly. There is a way that seems right to a man, to a human being, but in the end it leads to death. That's Proverbs 16, 25. So what's the answer? Is there an alternative to the world's way of following our heart? The only way is to have our heart remade from within by turning our hearts and lives over to Jesus, making him the owner and king of our hearts. We aren't going our own way anymore because our hearts and will and desire will have been subsumed in Him and what He wants and intends for us. Paul said it this way in uh, Galatians 2, verse 20, about being His own but yet not His own because He is in Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It's not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I'm going to turn the rest of my time here, the next few moments, to our making Jesus the standard for how we'll live and act rather than our fickle hearts and desires. And a story from last century shows us the truth of needing the compass of Jesus for our lives in a powerful way. A U.S. maritime disaster, just a couple years after the sinking of the Titanic, tells the tale. So this is 1914. Congress convenes a hearing to learn what exactly happened off the Virginia 
coastline in January of that year when the steamship Monroe was rammed by merchant vessel Nantucket and eventually sank. As a result, 41 sailors lost their lives in the chilly Atlantic waters. The captain of Nantucket, the one that rammed the other ship, Osmond Berry, was arraigned on charges, but yet it was Monroe's captain, the ship that sank, Edward Johnson, who was grilled for five hours on the stand. It was determined that Johnson, this is a quote, navigated the Monroe with a steering compass that deviated as much as two degrees from standard magnetic compass. He said the instrument was sufficiently true to run the ship, and that it was customary for masters in the coastal trade to use such compasses. His steering compass had not been adjusted in the whole year that he was master of the Monroe. That faulty compass that seemed adequate most of the time for normal circumstances navigation proved instead to be otherwise directly contributing to the tragic loss of life. And here's the, the end of the matter with that story. The reminder for us is this. If the heart is like a compass, we need to regularly recalibrate our hearts, turning them, tuning them to be, react, to be directed to the Creator, our true north. It doesn't matter what area of life you're talking about. There have to be standards in place. Uh, by definition, a standard can be thought of as an agreed-upon norm used by people, industry, government, that outlines the best way to complete a task, whether it's developing a product, providing a service, controlling a process, or interacting with the world. In all those cases, we need a standard. And in any aspect of life you want to describe, there are ways by which one must measure up to some kind of standard. And when folks admit to this reality, and eventually they have to if they want to live in this world, it's the closest thing that some come, some come to admitting that there truly are some things such as moral absolutes, ways by which our lives are be governed, really not just for our own good, but the good of all. Now, where do those standards come from? Obviously, they come from the Almighty God. Time and time again, our founding fathers said so, because they kept going back to God's Word. People today don't believe that's the basis for our, our governmental structure, but it is. Time and time they went back to His Word, holding it up, specifically the Ten Commandments, as a standard for guiding people's behavior in the days of the budding republic. Now, if you still say, well, now, that doesn't matter to us today. If you still believe we don't live by standards, I would urge you to go ask one of the many thousands of people who are lifetime residents now in one of our many crowded penitentiaries in our country, correctional facilities. They can tell you that we are a people who punish and violate uh, those who violate certain standards of behavior. Who are intent, as many of them still are, to follow their hearts and become gods in and of themselves to do as they please. Many of those uh, convicted are, are still that way. Uh, all those who track this very closely can tell you the recidivism rate is high. That is, if, if one gets out, the likelihood of them returning is very high. Okay, Those who have committed major crimes. Because they have that, that mindset to follow their heart. It's what they do. Let me close out with saying a little bit more about how we need to calibrate the moral compasses in our heart to Jesus' standard, to whom we look as a model for our lives in Christ. Acts 11 talks about the, the first time the term Christian was rolled out, you know, heard, heard publicly. They were called Christians first at Antioch. I believe it's verse... Uh, 11 verse 26, I believe. Someone can correct me on that later. But uh, maybe maybe partly that was used as a mocking, kind of a derisive kind of name. Christian. Little Christ is what they're really saying when they use that. But it was partly out of respect for the fact that if you wanted to see someone who modeled the man Jesus, 
more than anyone else, who did you look to? You looked to those people who called him their Lord and Master. So in, in a way, it was intended by many as a word of honor. Well, they're following, they're truly following their Lord, whom they call Christ. Think about this for a moment. Doesn't it sort of bother you when you get asked by someone, and I know you do because I get asked those things, sometimes at various times, well, what does your church say about this or that issue of the day? Be it the latest form of sexual immorality or degrading of a person God created someone to be, etc., whatever it might be. Doesn't it bother you if someone asks you that? Let me give you the best answer to questions like that. The best answer is, my church doesn't say anything about it. Because it's not the church's job to hold or make positions about anything. Rather, we strive to live by what our Lord and Master says about it. Regarding any issue, the church is never the standard. The Lord of the church is the standard. He is the one by whom we guide everything we do and say and where we go and all the rest. Note how folks in Apostolic Church would have answered questions about what does the church think about X, Y, or Z. In Acts 2.42, Luke tells us what this fledgling community of Christ's disciples used around which to form and shape their lives and their practices. Very simple. This is it. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Well, let's start with the first one. Where does the apostles' teaching come from? Jesus! It came from Jesus. So really what they're saying is they formed themselves around Jesus' teaching and around community formation that he modeled with the twelve and around regular remembrance of him and his sacrifice in taking the Lord's Supper and in sticking to the only way in which we draw strength that we need from God and express our dependence on him, prayer. Jesus was their standard in every way. It was to him and him alone they looked for their teaching, for instruction on how to live their lives. They didn't get it from a church. Neither should we. The church is not our Lord. Jesus is. The church is made up of folks who make mistakes. Jesus does not. Let's notice quickly how Paul demonstrated looking to him alone for the standard in both the ways that I've just mentioned before we close. In doctrine, in teaching, Paul made plain it several different times. He took his cues for all he said in preaching and teaching from Jesus alone. There's a reason for this. Was he commissioned or called by any, any congregation of a church? No. He was called and commissioned directly by Christ Jesus. Therefore, he didn't really have to look to anyone else for direction in his ministry, only to the Master. So we read him saying in Galatians 1 that when he was called by God's grace to be one of the Lord's apostles, he said, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Now, we don't know. There's a blank spot there. We don't know what Paul did in Arabia, but we have a pretty good idea. From what he says everywhere else, he was being trained by Jesus Christ. He was getting it, the cues that he needed from him, the instruction that he needed from him. He was having direct fellowship with him. Paul would later tell the Corinthians how he first approached them in his ministry among them. This is 1 Corinthians 2 and the first five.
as I follow the example of Christ. Now, some translations put it, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now, if you're not careful, you read that, you're, you, you say, Paul's bragging there, isn't he? He's kind of saying, well, I'm the one that you need to look to because I'm the one that's doing it right. I don't see it that way. I'm picturing Paul's full meaning that he doesn't, he doesn't say it all in words. But his full meaning, I believe, is in all the ways you see me acting in any given situation like Jesus would act, follow me in those things. Follow me in those ways. Don't, don't follow me when I'm getting it wrong or when I'm making a, a wrong impression for Jesus. But if I'm loving God and people the way Jesus did, if I'm responding to all the different life situations that come to me as Jesus would respond, then follow me in that. Follow me in those things. Make Jesus your standard for how you live. See, here's the reason we've had through the centuries this great explosion of, of, of different religious faiths, different religious groups, many of which claim Christ, is that over time folks slowly got away from looking solely to Jesus as a standard. Their compasses may have nav navigated them fairly well most of the time, by being two or three degrees off. But over time, it ends up taking them in the wrong direction. And over time, you can tell when you measure many up against Jesus, they've gotten far away from the standard in both teaching and lifestyle. So remember, getting back to what Mr. Jobs said, we cannot follow our hearts as... Satan or others would urge us. Because in their unredeemed state, they're faulty. They will always lead us astray. We've got to turn them over to Jesus, let him recalibrate them to the compass of his standard, his will. That's the only way we will end up one day being with him in eternity. And that's the ultimate destination for which we are all, I hope, for which we are all navigating and using the compass of his will, his way, for us to safely make it there. Let's measure everything that we do by him as a standard and let others see that coming out <clears throat> in our lives. If you have a need, come to him today to correct your course. If we as family can help you do that, make it known while we stand what we saying. And on way, Lord, I
Good morning. It's good to see each one of you here this morning. We've got so many vacant seats, it's hard to crawl the roll of those that are not here. Nor do I want to call the roll that are here. But I want you to take note of those that are missing and wonder why. I want to encourage as we leave here this morning that we check on, we look after folks that we miss. And hopefully you'll join me in doing just that. The bulletin is chock full of information that alerts us to the needs of some of our members. Uh, and I would urge you to take a look at the bulletin list. And, and then, again, check on folks. Let them know that we miss them. Let them know that we care. We are a body of believers that I think need to set the pace in looking after one another. And, and my thoughts this morning would be, uh, let's, let's be about that business. Certainly, I think the shepherds ought to be about the business of shepherding, but you as member needs to be in touch with other members. And I would encourage you to, to take part in all of that. That's part of the Christian life that we are to offer the example to other people in. I'm impressed with the, the words of the, the last song that we sang this morning, Have Thine Own Way. And for me, that suggests uh, we need to look to God to make us to be what He wants us to be, clear and simple. That we are to be modeling our life after Christ, of course. But God is in charge, and God has some influence that we haven't even imagined. And I would urge you to read the the words of that song again and again and understand that's what we are to be about. Seeking God's help, becoming more dependent on Him and more trusting in Him than we've ever experienced before. We are people, I think, that have come to be more and more independent. Our nature is do it yourself. I want to do it myself from the time that we are very small. I want to do it myself. And you've heard, if you want it done right, you've got to do it yourself, that kind of thing. We don't play that up as we should, that we need to seek God's help in fashioning and shaping, molding, as it were, molding our lives. I wasn't asked to get up here and offer you a sermon this morning. Those things had to come to mind this morning, I believe. Again, I would urge you to look for a way to unite this body together as one. That we might enjoy the unity of the Spirit and that we might enjoy the blessings of God all the more. Would you pray with me? Holy Father, we're thankful today that we are here in your presence and that of our Lord Jesus. We've come, Father, to worship, to offer you our praise, to offer you our petitions and prayer, to hear again a lesson from your inspired word. We're here together, Father, and we ask you this morning to unite us all the more. Bless us, Father, that we might know your presence both here and even as we leave here this morning. Bless us that we might know your presence and your power in our lives and realize that we, we live to serve only you and bring honor and glory only to you. Help us, Father, to touch the lives of others, to be about the business of sharing the life that we have, the word that we have, the message of salvation with those that urgently need it. Bless us, Father, as we leave this place that we might realize that we are a part of this body of Christ. We are a part. We need to be active involved. We thank you, Father, for blessing us as you have, for blessing this church, for letting us know time and again that you're here 
And even as we leave, Father, we pray that you would help us remember that we are only a part, that we are one of this body of Christ. Thank you, Father. We pray that you would continue to bless us with your presence in our lives. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Please stand. What a wonderful, wonderful day. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>